Yeah, we're live. It's even before 7 o'clock. It's 6.49, so I am 11 minutes early. <laughs> I'm going to try to hold up 11 with my 10 fingers. That would have been awesome. Uh, today, we're going to talk about emissions legal power, only because there are lots of ways to get more power. Obviously, you're going to add heads, cam, intake. You know, you can get all kinds of different force induction blowers and turbos and nitrous and all, all kinds of stuff. But the reality is, in that, and I've, I've actually been wanting to do this for a long time. And I wanted to do it I, way back in the five liter days. I kind of wanted to do it. I wanted to do it with a, a five liter Mustang engine, although you could pick others as well. It's just with the five liter deal we had to deal with, especially here in California, that you have to deal with, you, you want to have smog legal modification. So things that have... Um, the uh, EOs on them, executive orders, so that when they lift the hood and go, hey, look, you can't have that, an air intake or this intake manifold or whatever the change is, that you can say, hey, look, this has an emissions number or, or a, an a carb exempt number, and um, I, I, I'm okay, because this is actually a legal product. But what happens is these guys would have had to go through the test procedures, the expense and the tests to make sure that the product that they were trying to, the performance product that they were sell, trying to sell, um, either one didn't affect emissions at all, kind of like uh, cat backs and things like that, that kind of have no effect on that, or that they, they were made in a way like with Kenny Bell supercharger kits or Vortex supercharger kits, those kinds of things that um, they did went through all the testing and verified that, hey, look, these don't increase emissions at all uh, for your emissions testing. And so they go through that. It's a tough procedure and it's expensive for them to do all that testing, but you get a part that you can buy and not have to worry to, about it if it, you get pulled over and that it's not emissions compliant. So you have emissions compliant stuff. So my question is, and, and all of this stuff, um, is that we could, it's possible to build quite a bit of power. And especially when I was looking back at it, at, at the five liter, as you see, I got my other guy shirt on. Awesome. What's up? Two thumbs up. Um, uh, back in the five liter days, I was looking at, okay, look, there are lots of good emissions, uh, components that you could buy that, that are smog legal and still make power. So there are camshafts available. There are cylinder heads available, like the, for instance, the trick flow had emissions legal heads available. There are intake manifolds that are available. There are supercharger kits. Vortec had emissions legal supercharger kits and, and, and others as well. So the, the thing that I'm wondering, and I, and I haven't done the research maybe as much as I should have to find this out. And I don't think that technically it would be emissions legal, but my question is, can you have all of these individual emissions legal parts on there? Like if you pick the camshaft, like the, the comp or the crane or the Ford racing emissions legal cam, and then you pick the trick flow cylinder heads and, and in, intake manifold, maybe they have a whole assembly that's emissions legal. Um, and then you upgrade that with a vortex supercharger that's also emissions legal. And the and the shorty headers that are also emissions legal. And, and back in the day with the five liter stuff, there were probably um, aftermarket H pipes with cats on them that were also emissions legal. And the cat back obviously would be no problem. And you can do all of that stuff um, and, and maybe air intakes that were emissions legal. And could you combine all of that stuff and get the gains, especially with the blower on it? I mean, if you, if you have a modified 302 that has decent heads and a decent cam, a decent intake, and you add boost to that, obviously even better things are going to happen than if you're trying to supercharge a factory 225 horsepower, five liter motor. And, and the, the other stuff, obviously any kind of emissions legal supercharger assembly for any kind of LS combination is going to make a lot more power than that. And, and then if there are emissions legal camshafts, which I, maybe there are, um, I haven't even looked into that that much. Maybe I should on the LS side. I know on the five liter stuff, but if there are, and you could do that, then you could have quite a bit of power and, and still have it be emissions legal. It's still going through cats. Um, you can make all of that power and still not have to worry that if you, <laughs> if you're speeding, which obviously you shouldn't be. Uh, but if you are and you get pulled over and then, um, you know, they do a, a, a hood inspection or whatever, because we even have those inspections I've seen in California. I don't know if you guys have those in other parts of the world or even in other states, but they have inspection inspections just set up on the side of the road where you drive by, they flag you in. They're going to check and make sure that all of your stuff is, is, is copacetic and you're not running around with something that you shouldn't be. So if you have those and you have to go through inspection, then you'll realize that having something that is emissions legal is 
you know, <laughs> is okay. And maybe that's not the way that it is in every other state, but I can tell you that if it's not yet, it's probably going to be. Um, and, and, and I was looking at that like, oh yeah, we, you know, everybody dislikes the fact that we, we can't have any kind of combination on there that we want. And then on the other side is the other group of people that you only need to have a stock car. You don't have to do anything. And then, then everybody else is in the middle of that. Um, and that there's a, there's, there are ways to have, like I said, if you just list all those things, cam, it heads, cam, intake, and a blower, and that's all of the stuff that you would be putting on there anyway. And then if all of that stuff is emissions legal, the, the downside to the, at least to the people that make that is very, very expensive for those guys to certify their stuff, which is why a, a, a little guy in a shop or a little guy starting out and making one or two or three or four parts or whatever, he probably can't even afford that. He can't afford to go through the certification process to get his fancy new air intake or his headers or those kinds of things. And some of the things you just can't get emission certified. Uh, a long tube header is a fairly good example. Um, they don't want you moving the cats. They don't want you repositioning them. So long tube header obviously changes the whole dynamics of the, of the exhaust. The thing that's um, the thing that's disappointing for me is that this isn't all just a like with uh, getting sm getting your car smog checked. So they they've set standards that you have to pass. Your car has to go in. It can't make more than this on NOx and CO and all these values. So you go in and have a check and it passes all of those things. It also has to pass the visual inspection, which is the thing that we're talking about with all these performance modifications that you, you can have this because it has the right kind of sticker. Never mind what it does to the emissions. They've obviously have it tested and it would, did what it was supposed to do. But let's say that you did other things to your car and, and that make more power, but also don't make it produce more emissions that it would go in and it would technically pass a sniffer test. I mean, shouldn't that be the real litmus test? If you're, if you, if they decide that you shouldn't increase the emissions output and your car can go in and pass a, a sniffer test and it does exactly what it does when it's stock or, you know, in unmodified form, shouldn't that be what they're interested in? But, but it doesn't really seem to be. Um, and that's a little disappointing. I'd like for somebody just to, just to set the bar and go, you have to do this. And we're like, and then the performance industry just responds and says, okay, we'll do that. And, and we can do that in a variety of different ways. Um, but you can't keep having a moving bar for us. You can't go, okay, here's, you have to have no more emissions than this. Okay. We can do that. We can still make power. No, we don't like that. We don't want you to make power. <laughs> so, so, uh, that, that part of it is a little disappointing. Um, and then we have, and you have to get your, you know, to get your car registered, you have to have it uh, smog tested. I think every two years is, is what we do here. Um, and then obviously there are stuff that there are some of the things, some of the older vehicles that are exempt and they should be because nobody drives around on a, you know, a 1970 Camaro very much. And the amount of miles that they put on that are, are, are almost nothing. So the amount of emissions output that they would have or would be very minimal. And the great thing about that is, and, and those are perfect examples of, it, of, of this emissions thing that if you took a 1970 Z28 Camaro and, and ran it the way that it came from the factory and ran it uh, and did an emissions test on it, there would be so many things that you could do to make that car more powerful and reduce the emissions all in one thing. And I would think that people should be for that. Like, Hey, I can take this thing that actually, because it's, as old as it is, doesn't have any, doesn't have to get smog text checked. Um, I can make it make more power. Like if we were to transplant an LS motor into it and run that LS motor, that's going to make a hundred or 200 more horsepower than the motor that was in there. But while it's doing that, it's also going to be fuel injected. It's going to get better mileage. It's going to reduce emissions. It's going to do all these great things. Um, and, and, we should be able to do that stuff. Unfortunately, some, some of the stuff we can't do. So let me know what you guys are thinking. <laughs> yeah, the bar, bar moves. Yeah. I, I don't like moving bars. I, I don't mind somebody setting even a high bar. They say, look, you, you, we, this is what we want you to have. Okay. That's very difficult, but that sets a goal for us. And then we, we try to do that. And I think that we can, I think that people would be surprised at how much power we can make and still be emissions compliant. If all they said was, look, this is, this is the amount of emissions that you can make. Okay. We got that. We, we can make that happen. 
Um, so let me know what you guys think. Let, let me know what kind of parts you would put on your <laughs> on your five liter, for instance. Steve M, can I have your shop? I don't have a shop, so that's not uh, that. I don't work on cars, or I don't tune cars. I don't do any of it. Yeah, Tim, I'm glad you put the legal in air quotes on a 347. <laughs> The Vortex supercharger that I had on my Mustang was emissions legal. I, I've never, Andrew, that's a good question. He wants to know if E85 uh, is a benefit when looking at emissions. Does it reduce or change NOx or hydrocarbons? I don't know. I've never run a test to see what the change was on E85. Yeah, Broke is saying they have emissions testing in southern Idaho since in 1982 and up. And see, that's the other thing is I thought that they were going to continue to move the bar like it was going to be a 20-year thing that everything before that, because the number of cars that you have in, after 20 years goes down dramatically. Obviously, we don't see a ton of 1955 Chevys driving around or even 1970 Camaros driving around. They, they would be few and far between. Yeah, make sure to like the video. They just, Mark's saying they just ended emissions inspections where I'm in North Carolina. They don't check anything. Wow. Rags in the house. Uh, Admiral says that E85 and all their alternative fuels are great for emissions. Uh, things straight legal hot rods could run cleaner on fuels than regular gasoline. Still waiting for the three. Hendered test, me too. I can't pass emissions with a 99 GTP and a 93 LX 5 liter. That's why I will never move somewhere that requires emissions testing. When I look at areas, that's one of the first things I check. That's one of that's one of the go no go things. Uh, hey, Richard, I recently got my first car, which is a 1988 Fox Mustang. Nice. I like it with a five liter and exhaust recommendations. Um, the cat pad that I ran on mine that I liked that I, that sounded really good was a Borla. That thing sounded pretty nice. I actually, which was a mistake, ran super trap mufflers. On it. <laughs> and it was, I thought it was cool to be able to kind of tune it, but what I was doing was restricting it. And I, I should have done, uh, back pressure testing with the, uh, with the super trap mufflers. Cause they are, they are fairly restricted. We ended up when I would run at the silver state, we would just take all the um, little silencer sections. We just take all of those out. So is a Holly ECU compliant? I don't think it is. I don't know that they've certified that. Here in uh, Frank, here in Puerto Rico, you have to emission test every year. See, there be everybody's, they're all cracking down on stuff. Yeah, Jason, you tested a th 
three liter Grand Am, but it had a 3.8 in it, and it would pass a sniffer test with no cab, but failed. Yeah, you got to have a cat there. That's kind of the, that's a big go, no go kind of thing. That should at least be there. Is Elbrock ProFlow 4 port injection EFI smog legal? I don't think that that is. It, it will say if you if you see a listing for it, they'll they'll definitely put that up because it's definitely a selling point. Ron wants to know, can you tell me how much power my stock 2003 4.3 liter bottom end can handle as far as boost? I, I don't know. I've never taken one of those to the maximum. I think we've made 700 or something with a turbo on those. Maybe guys have done more. If it's a 4.3 liter V6, um, then uh, the, the crankshaft is probably going to be the weak link. Uh, the fuel is already cleaner than the fuel of the 1970s, so an older vehicle would have less emissions because of it. Yeah, the things that I'm talking about are whatever fuel you test it with. Um, if you run a 1970, particularly a Z28 <laughs> or any 1970s car, and you um, put a modern fuel-injected motor in it, especially one that has a catalytic converter or catalytic converters, dual catalytic converters, it'll be dramatically cleaner and it would make a lot more power. Maryland has no emissions on anything past 25 years old. That's good, that's kind of the way that it should be. What if your car came from Japan? Um, unless it was legally imported, it would be a problem probably. Twenty-five years for exemption in Ohio. No emissions testing in Minnesota. LPG is a good source of emissions-friendly fuel. Yeah, I was wondering about um, propane and stuff. I thought that they were, I thought that they were using that forklifts and stuff inside, so it probably would be fine. In Texas, over 25 years old qualifies as classic plates and no emissions. No emissions test in Washington State as of one year ago. So something that they just recently changed. Uh, Robert, it doesn't matter what the question is. That's why this is a live chat. You can you can do anything you want. Turbo kit for my avalanche. I don't. I don't ever really test turbo kits specifically because I don't know about fitment in different chassis. So when I run stuff on the engine dyno, it's more just a turbo that I have and we make it work on the engine that we have. No more sniffer test, but they plug in and read. Yeah, that's what they do with a lot of the um, late model stuff. No emissions here in South Bend, but a few K 
counties over. Yeah, it seems to kind of be county specific. That's that's strange. Do you think electric cars will replace all the gas cars by 2030? I, I can't see all the cars being off the road by 2030. No emissions or checks in Alabama. Just curious, do you need to run knock sensors if you still, if you change your LS to carb? Are you still, Jason, are you having the factory ECU control it while you're running the carb? That would be unusual. My air fuel hangs at 14. Isn't that good enough? <laughs> No emissions in Alberta, up in, up in Canada. Yeah, cyber drive air, air quality is not a personal responsibility when something like 10 corporations create 90% of the pollution. That That's the thing. If you look at the, the pie chart of how much emissions the cars do relative to where all the real like um, pollution is coming from, they seem to be unnecessarily focused on a very small part of that pie when they could do a lot of other things to other people where there's much, much greater pollution. Um, the, some of the things that they're doing are going to have almost no effect at all on, on the air pollution if that's their concern. No test in Florida. Up here in Alberta, we don't have emissions testing. What exactly are they testing for? They're testing for NOx output and CO. Um, the thing just has to be the same as they want. They want it to be the same as it was in when it was new, but they have a slight sliding scale for that. We quote in high flow cats on all of our long two headers. I don't know what that means. I took my cats off my first fox and slowed down in the quarter. <laughs> the RPM Act has seen us selling our souls. I, I think you have that wrong. I think that they're trying to help you. Yeah, I think diesel is particulate. Is that, that's, oh, soot, okay. So Phil wants them to put catalytic converters on airplanes too. I think EPA restrictions in California were great and that engineers created more power than ever within those restrictions. We now have engines producing incredible amounts of power efficiently. The stuff that happened in California was probably the California Air Resources Board. <laughs> Daniel, you're going to keep asking your a question on, on PFI speed. I, I like Brent. And I, I, obviously, we, nobody wants them to get fined. A lot of engine swaps in Australia get approved on the emissions compliance side when running log. Oh, propane. Yeah, and I think that for a long time, I think that propane was um, emissions exempt, I think. 
uh, if I remember right. I remember reading about Ack Miller doing that stuff and that if you converted, that you no longer had to pass smog. Yeah, Mike, it might not matter what the states say if the, the EPA is, is definitely federal. Yeah, I think they even want to put cats on boats and um, <laughs> in your lawnmower and everything else. Emissions laws are for all 50 states. Don't believe it's not your problem just because they don't test. And that might be possible or, or might be likely. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Uh, serious fat. I just pulled dead cats off my 94 Corvette for LS swap and welded two brand new cats in. And that's good that you're putting those on. The problem is I know, and I, I know here in California that, they don't like you um, <laughs> changing the cats. You have to have California certified cats. Um, I remember when I was trying to get my Honda certified, it had a, a or, or get it emissions tested. It had a cat on it. And just to make sure that it passed, I put another cat on it. I just, just went and bought a, um, like a high flow cat. So it had two cats on it. So it was twice as clean as it would be normally. And this was a stock motor. There was nothing done to it. They wouldn't pass it because it had the second cat on it. I'm like, really? You don't want it to be, I said, it passes, right? Oh yeah, it passes with flying colors. It's it's like ultra clean. I said, well, but isn't that better than it not passing? Um, because it has the factory cat on it. It's there. It's part of the, it's part of the, the, it bolts to the stock exhaust manifold basically on that particular, on that particular model. And then I welded another one in the exhaust and then it had the factory size exhaust and factory muffler and all that stuff on it. So there were, and they said, no, you can't, you can't have that second cat on there. I'm like, okay. okay. And we took it off and it still passed with the stock cat on there. Like, like I knew that it would, but they just didn't want that. Uh, do you read spark plugs when tuning? Yes. No emissions in Kentucky. LPG with boost and I will, it would run 18 to one NA Rhode Island, no emissions on 25 year old cars, no safety or emissions on 25 year olds with antique plates. Uh, the EPA is trying to kill the industry. They just want to control everything, get rid of Biden and his committee and get rid of the problem. Um, Biden and the EPA are separate. <laughs> All of this EPA stuff started way before Biden. <laughs> do you do dyno tuning? No, I don't. I only tune my own stuff on the engine dyno. Um, and I'm not a guy you would want tuning it anyway. <laughs> Shane, my highly modded 93 Jeep tests cleaner than stock and no longer fails Knox. Nice. My 79 Bronco was swapped in 460. All smog components have been parked 20 years. Even has a California referee sticker. Nice. Yeah, electric cars are definitely not the a answer. Uh, 
Washington State monitor emissions and they have been silly falling thanks to new car purchases. That's true. A lot of times um, I remember, and this was probably back in the 70s or maybe early 80s, um, doing a smog check up in Long Beach and the in a new car, the output of the exhaust was actually cleaner than the air outside. <laughs> so, so the car was, <laughs> by running the car, it was effectively cleaning the air. Yeah, the electric vehicles are not zero emission vehicles. <laughs> the power that they're using had to come from somewhere. And that and production of that power caused emissions. So you, whether it's um, from coal or any other source, all they've done by having electric vehicles here is they've outsourced all of the um, emissions output. So they want all the out, they want another state or another country preferably is i think what they're going for and so that we can all drive around and not pollute anything and all the pollution could come from somewhere else that generates the electricity the problem is if it's somewhere else and they decide that we don't get it anymore that would be a problem vacuum assist manifold pressure on turbos I don't understand what you're asking. You know, we really need nuclear powered cars. <laughs> so everybody needs to glow. Well, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Mike, Democrats want to want to end internal combustion engines. So you want to have a you want to have an enemy, and you've decided that this, despite the fact that this is obviously automotive related, but now it's got to be politically motivated. That's just silly. Cats on boats, planes, what? Uh, uh, does China want greater demand for their rare earth metals? It, it, and, and if you look at it, usually the best way to look at it is, is, you, is you chase the money. You find the trail toward the money. So what is the, what is the decision? And then because of that decision, who stands to benefit from that? And that's where you look at. And then if those people stand to benefit from it, how are they affecting this decision making? Who are they influencing to get that? That's kind of the circle of life there. But with the EPA, I, I don't think that that's it. I don't think that this is money related. Tim, doesn't the 14th Amendment stop the EPA from superseding state law? But the problem is that even though there's something telling you that, hey, you can't do this, if you do it anyway, despite the fact that there's something telling you that you shouldn't be able to do it, if you do it anyway and there's no oversight, and there's no consequence for you doing it, what's going to stop them from doing it? Let's see.
Yeah, I agree. Uh, fascist pennant. Nixon started the EPA. LA would be unlivable if it not for emissions regulations and a lot of other places too. Any, any, any um, high pop population density areas would be like that because that <laughs> it was terrible there for a while. Um, and it made it a lot better. And so I, I have no problem with running cats on my car and driving around and, and having to do that. Like I said, as long as it should be that common sense should prevail and it, and it doesn't in a lot of cases. And like I said, if it says, okay, here is the level that you need to meet. Okay, we'll do that as long as we can do our own things and individualize our cars. We should be able to do that as long as we're still emissions compliant, as long as we're still able to meet whatever this sniffer test is that determines the output that we make. As long as we have that, we kind of should be able to do that. But EPA is not Biden controlled, not in any way, shape or form. They were there long before he was there and they would be there long after he's gone. Um, and they've been trying to do their own thing along for a long time. Let's see, Richard, give me a recipe for 87 octane, 515 to 540 horse 402 Big Luck Chevy. We'll be using 049 heads, 275 C. So are they ported 049 heads? And and why would you do a 402 instead of doing something bigger than that? Um, an 87 octane? That's going to be... That's going to be a little harder to do. Um, it's going to, if you want to do it on that low of octane, it's going to have to have a lot of camshaft in it with that cylinder head on it. And I think that you can get a lot more flow out of an 049 head with porting. Um, I think that we've made, I want to say on the first big block Chevy head test, it probably made 550 or 600 or something. I don't think nitrous is technically legal, smog legal. Can't even drive my truck on the street with peace of mind anymore. Uh, a little off topic, but in regards to the previous video, how would you rate the overall efficiency of the Torx Storm Supercharger in comparison to a similarly sized uh, Pro Charger? I don't think that there is one that's sized the same. A P1SC is is going to be bigger than a Torx Storm. The Torx Storm can make 700 to 750 horsepower. That's kind of what where they're flow limited at, at least in my testing, that's where they've been. Um, I think most of the pro chargers are going to make more than that. They could, they're just bigger, better blowers and they can support more. It's not, an, it's not that one impeller design is more efficient. Um, the, the superchargers themselves will just support more power level. Julius, what's up? Vern, I'm in California. I like 1965 cars. It's politically motivated. The EPA is not politically motivated. <laughs> Yeah. 
Have you ever tested the Edelbrock ProFlow on a small bot forward? I don't think I have. EPA needs better guidance and more focus on what their purpose is. <laughs> I think somebody needs to ask them what their purpose is. California doesn't have annual vehicle inspections. We have to have smog tests every two years. Five hundred horsepower, three hundred and fifty, three hundred and sixty, or three hundred and fifty-one would be cheap. Uh, you can make five hundred horsepower with boost. Um, it would be harder to do that in a. That's what we were talking about, Julius, earlier, is that we'd just like to see a level. Look, tell us what we have to meet, and we'll do it, and then we'll still be able to modify our cars while doing that because we're very good at what we do, and it will be the world would be a better place. <laughs> Have you ever done a dyno using a big block 292 head? Um, I don't, is that a casting number? I'm not familiar with the 292. Uh, would they notice, notice an HP tuner reflash tune with a plug-in emissions test? Uh, they probably could. Can you build an NALS with all low-end torque? Um, yeah, the best thing to do would be make it bigger. The Air Pollution Control Act was 1955, so you started thinking about it way back then. The Clean Air Act was 1963. EGR absolutely increases mile per gallon, decreases pumping losses at part throttle. Yes, it's a semi-open closed, and the 243 or the 241 are the same. <laughs> Tom, this is a problem with the auto industry. Leftist Democrats in California control auto magazines and organizations. You haven't obviously met very many of them. They all deny this is political and get on board. The rest of the nation knows it's political. Everything has to be political. You should check with the EPA. The EPA has been there with red political people and, and blue political people, and the EPA does what the EPA does. They're not listening to either one of those. They don't want it. As a matter of fact, they want to be in charge. They don't want to be overseen by a, either one of those guys. Yeah, church, the, you, you guys should know. <laughs> They California pulls all CVNs now on OB2 ECUs. They will notice a tune. I they, and they do, and they they don't even. I, I think that they're getting good enough to where they would notice even if you took the tune back out and installed the factory tune back in, that they would know that you did that. Admiral's out. Uh, 
Julius, that's what we were talking about. His comment was that it's not political, however, it might be financially motivated. I was trying to figure out how the EPA was going to benefit financially from the decisions that they're making about this stuff when there's not real money in the automotive section. If you look at where the pollution is coming from, the rest of our little pollution pie here, the automotive part is very, very small. The rest of where the pollution comes from comes from really big business where there's lots and lots of money. And I would think if anybody, they would go after them. But I don't know why they're going after these small time things. The, the, the kind of fines that we're talking about are nothing compared to the kind of money that the rest of that pie is making. Let's see. On engine mass, there's a stock versus a stroked 50 cubes only netted eight horsepower at the peak that be because the heads aren't very good. Yeah, if you if you restrict the combination with something else, the heads cam and intake, even though you went up in displacement, it can ultimately become more restrictive. Because if you have, let's say, I'll make it easy. If we have cylinder heads that are 300 horsepower cylinder heads and we're running them on a 300 horsepower five liter motor and we go up to a 5.8 liter or a six liter motor and we still have 300 horsepower heads on them, they're not, they're only going to do a little bit better. They're not going to do a whole bunch better. Are EGR cat air pump, et cetera, necessary if an engine is built and tuned correctly? Uh, yes. To reduce emissions, those things will reduce emissions. They're not going to be necessary to make it make more power. They can't tell if you return it back to stock yet. Okay. Uh, Mike, well, I'm not saying it's not political. What I'm saying is it's not a right-wing conspiracy or a left-wing conspiracy. It's not motivated by one or the other of the sides. They're their own thing. And so whatever, however motivated the people are in the EPA, it's not because Trump is telling them what to do or because Biden is telling them what to do. They're doing their thing. And they may be either left of center or right of center. <laughs> but it's not because these outside sources are telling them what to do. Peter, could a small block Ford 351 stroker with smog legal AFR 165 heads XE 264 cam smog compliant and rock performer smog compliant all the smog pump would it be possible to stay within smog legal? Uh, uh, that's what I asked earlier: is if you put all these individual emissions legal parts on there, um, would it still technically be legal? I think that it would. Um, the 331 maybe not, <laughs> but on a 304. Two, it would be, and it would definitely pass smog. If you ran that combination with he even headers and cats, it would pass smog. I know that because we, we had done those tests long time ago on my five liter Mustang. We had a 274 cam in that. We had aluminum heads on it. We had a ported Cobra intake on it. We had a Vortec on it. And as long as it had the cats on it, it would still pass without any problem at all. Richard, will gapping my son's rings for use with NOS, NOS raise emissions? I think it probably would. I've actually never tested that for emissions output, but I would think that it would. <laughs> Can open worm escape. <laughs> Yeah, Luke, that's something that a lot of people don't realize is the level of um, testing and design and, and R&D that go into factory ECU stuff because they have to do, 
high elevation stuff. They have to do ultra hot stuff, ultra cold stuff. They have to do what I call the stupidity factor of people that want to do and drive around doing dumb things that no sane automotive enthusiast would ever do, you know, putting the thing in six gear at a thousand RPM and trying to lug it up a hill, pulling a trailer or, or, or the opposite end of that is running at first gear all the way out to 7,000 RPM at part throttle with almost no load. Like I've never even looked at that part of the curve because nobody does that. Nobody should do that. You should have shifted a long time ago, but they have to do all that. And it's a great deal of work that they put in before and they have to make it, and, you know, pass all emissions and not detonate and all of these things. And so it's a tremendous amount of work and make it last and make it be cost effective and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Mountains garage. We're going to have to put them in our pre World War II cars. Randall, I read your book on high performance focus builder. I want to turbo and need to say legal. How are you going to, are, are there emissions legal turbos for the focus? Far left wing communist groups fund the research. <laughs> oh. The and also the EP has no, there's no one to go tell on. They're, they have no oversight, so that you can't go say, "Hey, look, I think the EPA is overstepping their bounds, so we need to rein them in a little bit, or, or find out what why why they're doing what they're doing." But there's no nobody to go talk to about that. <laughs> they tell you go talk to the EPA about that, and the EPA says we'll do whatever we want. And there's nobody else above them to say, "Hey, look, you." you need to tell us what the thing is that you're trying to get done and let's figure this out. What's your opinion on total seal rings? Um, I've used them before on any motors. I've never tested them on. Uh, I use them on my engine master's motor, but I've never tried them on boosted applications. <laughs> Jewish needs to get past this red versus blue stuff. I, I agree. I, I I think it's silly. Uh, the thing that I always tell people is that they they tend to forget because everybody thinks that whatever their side is absolute. They forget that there's not a red side and a blue side. That America really is red, white, and blue. Um, but and I know I'm not familiar with Macron. What it, what is that? That must be some sort of political Australia stuff. Yeah, Shane, I agree. The the um, the, <laughs> they do want to change the world, and the people that are there are a unique group. When when you go, I, I remember one of the guys telling me, and, and I think I don't think this was EPA though. I think this was CARB. Uh, I remember somebody telling me that was taking a product in to get emission certified, and they kept telling him, "No, it doesn't pass. It doesn't pass. It doesn't pass." But they're like, "Look, th this in every way outperforms the factory one." The, the emissions are lower. Everything about it lasts longer. It's everything about it is better. Well, and what they told them from these people from CARB said, we don't understand why people would want to modify cars. So those are the people that are in charge of whether or not the people that are trying to get 
these things be emissions compliant and, and do the testing and jump through all the hoops that they have to do, that's the kind of person that they're dealing with. A guy that doesn't want people to do what these guys are trying to certify. So it's, yeah, it's just frustrating, I'll bet. Oh, Macron is a French president. Okay. See, I'm not, I'm not very politically motivated. <laughs> Yeah, pro-charge Mopar, I agree. If it's if it's a red divided by blue and it's, it's divided, then we all lose. And that the interesting thing is if you look back through history, our first president, who didn't want to be president, they, George Washington, they wanted him to be king. He said, nope, I'll pass on that. They wanted to be president. He said, no, I'll pass on that. As far as I know, he's the only president that didn't want to be president. So I like that. Big thumbs up for George. Um, obviously, he had other issues. But his two friends, Hamilton and Jefferson, so disagreed that they couldn't even be in the same room and they were best friends, both were best friends with George. And, but they, they're politically, obviously they were right and left and said, Hey, we're going to go off and we're going to start our own, um, uh, political wings. We're going to have a right and a left wing basically. And he said, no, you guys can't do that. He said, if you do that, this country is just starting out. And if you do that, this will be to the demise of this United States. And they were just now trying to get this United States as a United States. And he said, you do not want to start a two party system. And they said, screw you. We're going to go do it anyway. Cause they used to fight and stuff. He used to have to separate them. And so when they went, uh, okay, we believe this and we believe this and we hate you and we hate you. And that's what started all of this. And, and it, it has been to the demise of the United States. Oh, they're giving his most neutral political speech again. <laughs> Dig up half the earth for making batteries sounds environmentally friendly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Julius, French President Yves Gillette shown problem with being a dual citizen French and Australian. Okay. Damn, I could. I guess I could deal with electric cars, but I'll play with uh, ICs and internal combustions as long as they let me. How tough are stock LS3 valves? Um, they're not what I would choose for lots of boost on stuff, but they work pretty well. So how much boost do I need to split my 5.7 Magnum? <laughs> we are going to test that. <laughs> Let me know what happens. I don't know about the strength of the Mopar stuff. I, I haven't run enough. I've only run a few Mopars on the dyno. So I don't, I've run a, a Magnum and I've run a LA. We did a few tests on that stuff, but I have no idea. Like we've never run enough boost to be anywhere near where it's going to be. I'm in Canada. Is the APA trying to battle noise pollution or smog? I, well, the, I think that the idea is smog and not, not noise really, but I, I don't think that they're exactly doing that either.
Do you think it'd be possible one day to charge up a bank of capacitors and just unleash them? I, I, I that that's my thing about like electric cars is like a Kenny Bell boosted pump. You know, you gotta you gotta be able to turn it up. Still looking forward to the next installment on the K24. Me too. I, I do want to run that. Electric dragsters, are you running seven? That's pretty sporty. Do you think a 660 double spring is too much for a stock Alice valve? No, it's fine. As a matter of fact, the, the video that I'm working on right now that I'm doing the editing on is, a, and let me know what you guys think. This will be interesting to see what you guys think about it. I ran a comparison between stock LS3 valve springs and a set of comp 26918 Beehive valve springs on a essentially stock LS3 just to see if the change in spring pressure had any effect on power. Then I also ran another test comparing the 26918 valve springs to a set of 660 double platinum springs from Brian Tooley Racing. Again, uh, with the same camshaft, again, just to compare it to see if adding the spring pressure had any effect on power. Did it, did it improve power? Did it decrease power because we have to compress the springs more? What did it do? And so that's the video that I have coming up. So let me know what you guys think. Uh, Julius, off topic, Richard, have you done everything with a five-cylinder Honda G motor? I have not. I did the five-cylinder that I really want to do, and I also want to do the four-cylinder version, and that's of the Atlas motor. I would like to, if we get, and I was talking to Calvin today, I was on the phone with him and his dad for about an hour, and they're great people. So if you haven't gone over to take a look at Calvin's, um, YouTube uh, channel. Make sure that you do. He's doing he's doing cool stuff over there. But I talked to him a lot about the stuff that we want to do, testing that we want to do on the 4200. But I would really like to also do the five cylinder and the four cylinder version, just so you know. There's lots of other applications that had those motors, like uh, I think Colorado's had the five cylinder and stuff. And so it would be cool just to do the family of engines with that, and it would be awesome. Uh, 632 big block Chevy build. Have you done it? Would you, I haven't, but the guys at, um, engine masters and at, and at West tech have done the, they've tested the, a couple of 632s that the guys from blueprint sent over. Cause they, I think that they have 632 crate motors. And so they've run a couple of those and some of them made some pretty good power. Uh, voltage, what are your thoughts on pre-emissions diesels versus emissions diesels? I, I don't, I'm not a diesel guy, so I haven't really done hardly any diesel testing. I had a, an 08 Dodge that we did some stuff with back in the day, but that's really it. Yes, the Atlas. And also I'm going to, going to pick up a Barra, so that will be cool. So we'll, we'll have both the Barra and the Amera Barra. Have you ever dynoed a 5.7 LS1 out of an 04 GTO? No, we've done lots of 5.7 LS1s. Most of them, I think, were Camaros. They they came from GM so that they were crate motors, but I think that they were F-body ones. <laughs> we, Calvin and I, are looking for the 2.9 Alice right now for our Sunbird. Very cool. And I think that Jerry has one of the five-cylinder versions. Is that that's a three-seven? I think. So let's see, Racer D. Why should spring pressure affect power if you do not have dynamic problem? Well, do you think that compressing the spring? The the question in this video is the reason that most people think that there's no change in power is we're compressing the spring and that takes power to compress the spring. It, 
it, when you spin a motor over it, you can feel it. It obviously takes power to compress the spring, but then there's stored energy in the spring and the stored energy is imparted back into the motor to kind of help you keep turning it. And as you go past it, the question is, is, uh, is that amount of input power the same as the output power? So that's what we're testing. Let's see. The lightest for where did that go? Here we go. The lightest force that controls the valve will make the most power. Is there any rule for how much power increase of head CFM will produce, like say a head that flows 300 versus 350, 335? The rule of thumb is this gives you an idea. Not every motor does this, but if you if your head flows 300 CFM, it will support 600 horsepower. Now, there's lots of applications where it makes more than that because guys are really good at making a, um, power from that airflow because it's not, strictly speaking, that's not the limit. Most motors don't do that. Most motors don't make two horsepower per peak CFM flow. So if you went from 300 to 335, you'd go from 600 to, what is that, 670 of potential. The thing is a lot of motors don't take advantage of all of that airflow. So you may put that on there and it might do nothing because the rest of the motor wasn't there to utilize the extra airflow. Let's see. Oh, uh, the five cylinders were 3.5, thinking 2.9, so it fits an LSR engine carry. That's smart. Yeah, you got to make it. You have to have the biggest motor that you can in the class that you have, and I'm sure that you're thinking about the 2.9 in the three liter class. From a physics standpoint, there would definitely be a loss, mainly because there's not at, they're not at 100% efficiency. That's right. What do you think about Visard's last video on rocket ratio testing and results by magazine guys? Uh, I haven't seen it. I have to take a look at it. Would love to see a GMH 308, 304 versus the American five liter hypo engine. I don't, I'd have to look and see what that is, Julius. It's, it's really hard for us to build another version from another country though. What do I use to tune my 2011 Chevy Express 4.8? I want to do dry nitrous. Well, what, what ECU do you have on there? So big gym leader, 70 L community, you pass with 15% nitro in it. <laughs> That's quite a bit. Uh, the stock van ECU. I don't know. You have to talk to Matt. I don't do a lot of testing with the stock stuff because I'm I'm not a tuner and I don't do tunes when people come in. Yeah, maybe ask Matt over at Sloppy about that and see if he can do a um if you're just adding the nitrous dry. And then maybe there's a way to tune the factory ECU to compensate. I just don't know how you trigger it, how you go from one tune to the other with a factory ECU. Oh, the Holden V8, heaps of aftermarket parts from Edelbrock. Okay. I have Vortec heads and wanted to upgrade the valve springs, so I need to unscrew install screw and studs. I would, if they're pressed in, I would put screw and studs in it. And the more that you go up in spring rate, the more chance you have to pull the stud. Yeah. 
Have you ever built a small block NA350 that focuses on off idle brute torque like a big block? <laughs> off off idle, so you want you want peak torque at like a thousand RPM. How beneficial in power are fuel injectors like injector dynamics? The the power that you get from injectors is primarily from injector sizing. You don't get power specifically from the injector. The injector size, how big they are, the amount that they flow, allow you to be able to tune up to a certain power level. So if you're making, you have a thousand horsepower turbo, you need injectors that will supply the fuel for a thousand horsepower. That's why you put bigger injectors in it. How do you feel about boost with stock lifters, push rods, and rockers? All of the um, all of the big bang motors were like that. Uh, we did occasionally upgrade the stock push rods, but the um, we normally do a push rod upgrade when we do a valve spring upgrade. But I'm thinking after talking to Matt about it that um, probably the stock push rods would work just fine. There are 70 of us that haven't declared a like. <laughs> Come on, guys. Get the likes going up there. Just change the exhaust push rod. There you go. Uh, Bruiser, a lot of guys running the stock push rods. And they're, and, and, but there are a lot of guys getting away with trying to see what they can get away with, <laughs> whether or not it's a good idea. Um, I like doing push rods, but... I. I'd like to run one or, or something with a lot of valve spring pressure, like a dual spring and just see what happens. See what happens with a stock push rod. The stock push rods hardened anyways. I'm not giving a like till you make over 8,500 RPM. I've done that on my Honda. If that counts. Yeah, and the and I've got to get going. But the person that asked me about the dry nitrous setup, um, if you're not running a big shot on a, and that's a stock 4.8, I don't know why you would be. If you're running a hundred shot or 125 shot, I just run a wet single fogger in it. We have good luck with that. Even with the truck intake and stuff, we did a fuel distribution or fuel and or nitrous distribution using that truck manifold, and it's actually fairly good. Um, we don't run big shots in them, but but at 100 or 125 it should be fine. Ever play with variable pitch torque converters? I have not. Uh, I remember they used to do that back in the day with the um, switch pitch converters, but I've never run one. When you test the RB25, are you going to run multiple turbos on it? Yes, we are going to run different turbos on it. It is kind of lame on a Honda. Everybody used to give me a hard time about running. Um, I, I never ran 9,000 RPM on my B16 or any of the B series that I did for Bonneville. Um, the highest I ever shifted one, I think was 8,700. And that was only because the fourth, fifth gear split was so dramatically tall that we revved fourth gear out so that when we shifted into fifth, which is where it pulled from 160 to 220 miles an hour, that um, we could keep it in VTEC in fifth gear where, where it was making power. And it worked a lot better with the turbo than we also ran it a, a lot of times with a Vortec on it. And the problem is when you get that big drop in RPM, that when you drop that much RPM, you dropped a lot of boost on a centrifugal blower. Lucky for us, when we were still in VTEC with the turbo, we were still making the same boost. So it was good. All right, Church. Thanks for being here, man. Tim, everybody, ProCharge Mopar. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Sorry about the topic. I didn't think we would go from emissions, legal performance stuff, which is what I wanted to talk about blowers and cams and heads and stuff. And then everybody started going off on all of this, this, you know, political stuff. Um, maybe I need to make a political channel. Then you guys could all come in here and we could all yell at each other. It'd be super awesome. Thanks for showing up guys. I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm going to be posting this video up on the valve shrink cast, which would be cool. Late.